welcome back to my little channel now you see the forest is out so we're going to talk about the environment but i'm going to start with some dry stuff okay so everyone keeps claiming co2 is this big bad monster of a gas because it holds on to heat and it creates a greenhouse effect um it doesn't really but it does a little bit i mean i'm not going to say it's completely not true and it's a good thing that it does because let's be honest if it didn't we would all die during the night because the planet would be very cold during the night but that's not the main point i'll get back to that in a moment but it is true carbon dioxide does hold back heat when heat from earth tries to escape into the atmosphere and into the dark dark beyond how does it do that well infrared light is being stopped by carbon dioxide not all of it obviously because most of the infrared light still leaves the planet because it does um, but carbon dioxide does stop some of the infrared light from leaving which makes sure that we don't die of well the cold is carbon dioxide the only one that does that no 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 no. water vapor does the very very same and when i mean the very very same they actually work within the same wavelength of light as carbon dioxide does and they're doing it at roughly the same effectiveness now this is a good thing as i said because during the day the sun bombards us with lots of light and i mean lots of light i mean the sun puts out more energy in a day than the whole planet uses in a year especially humans i mean we're not that big a deal when it comes to energy production the sun is um, at least 300 times more effective at it than we are now during the night the planet doesn't really get a lot of sunlight so the planet cools off and it can get really really cold during the night we're talking about freezing deep freeze so this would kill vegetation or rather it could damage vegetation but it would definitely kill us if we weren't to live in warm houses that's why i'm not afraid of an ice age by the way we, we can deal with that now but back in the days that would have killed us for sure so during the night instead of losing all our heat some of the heat is being captured by water vapor and carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide and a few other gases but everyone seems to care about carbon dioxide only so let's talk about carbon dioxide only carbon dioxide only at this point in time is to be said to be estimated around 400 parts per million we've been measuring it since the 1950s roughly and the first measurement said there was 205 sorry 250 parts per million but the 400 parts per million is now considered to be an average and i'm not sure if the 250 parts per million was an average as well or whether it was the highest measured or the lowest measured so we're going to assume it was the average oh by the way the 400 one isn't really an average it's a high average because there is also a low average because carbon dioxide isn't continuous if today it's 400 parts per million it doesn't mean that tomorrow it will be 400 as well hell it doesn't even mean that it will be 400 two hours from now so there are lots of things about the amount of co2 in the air that is continuously in a shift it's not a constant thing but okay enough of that the same is true obviously for water vapor now how do we know that water vapor and carbon dioxide are holding on to some of the heat because we can tell now places where we have lots of water vapor are also more moderate places where there is hardly any water vapor you will see large jumps in temperature what does that mean now for example on the north and south pole there isn't a lot of water vapor i'm going to assume carbon dioxide is the same there it's not by the way but let's assume it is um there is not a lot of water vapor because the temperature in the air there is so low that there isn't a lot of 
moist in the air. This means that during daytime there isn't a lot of blocking of sunlight, but the, the sun comes in at such an angle that the sunlight isn't that strong, so it's not giving off a lot of heat. But during the nighttime, there isn't a lot of energy or stuff in the air to hold the temperature. So it really gets cold at night. And um, okay, the North and South Pole are cold anyway, so what's the big deal? Well, the same is true for deserts. Obviously, the Sahara being a good example of that. There isn't a lot of water vapor in the deserts because there isn't a lot of water in those areas. Now, the temperature is high, so it theoretically could hold a lot of water vapor. But yeah, then there should be a lot of water vapor to be held, so to speak. So what happens in places like the Sahara? During the night, temperatures can drop to minus 50, even though during the day where they could be at plus 30. Always? No, not always. Obviously not always, but quite often. And the only thing they have is carbon dioxide, but they don't have a lot of water vapor. So they don't have a lot of greenhouse gas, so to speak, to keep the night heat in. So it, the Sahara bleeds a lot of the night heat into the atmosphere. Now, Carbon dioxide is often seen as the main cause of this problem. But I'll tell you this, carbon dioxide is at about 400 parts per million. And water vapor, well, water vapor isn't as tied down as carbon dioxide is in most of the studies. Why is that? Well, water vapor is usually dependent on a lot of things, for example, temperature. If the temperature is too low, then there won't be a lot of water vapor in the air. Look at the North and South Pole. But if the area is particularly dry, there won't be a lot of water vapor in the air either. So because of that, water vapor can be zero parts per million, but it can also go up to 3, 000, uh, sorry, 30,000 or sometimes even 40,000 parts per million, depending on where you are. Now, if I'm looking honestly in the Netherlands, um, we are living close to the sea. We have high air humidity, which is kind of funny because this means that at 21 degrees in the Netherlands, it is sweltering hot because there's so much moist in the air, your body can get rid of its sweat. That sounds like a nasty story, and maybe it is a little bit, but it means that the air is pretty much full at 21 degrees it can only take so much air humidity after a certain point it will not be able to take up a lot more of moist now wind may help move that a little bit so if you have a high wind the, the air can take in more moist funny enough but if there's not a lot of wind you'll just be sweating and your body can't get rid of its sweat because there's too much moist in the air already. That means that during the night it will hold on to the heat pretty effectively. Basically what everyone blames carbon dioxide of doing is being done by water vapor at least as good. But the funny thing is water vapor is far more prevalent than carbon dioxide. Does that then mean that a lot of water vapor does as much heat retention as a little bit of carbon dioxide? No. One carbon dioxide molecule is as good as holding heat as one water molecule is. Now during the day those water molecules form clouds and those clouds prevent some of the sunlight from hitting the earth. So during the day that water vapor prevents some of the heating effect that the sun has. But during the night, water vapor is by far the strongest greenhouse gas by holding in heat. Now that's again a good thing because if it didn't, we would all probably freeze to death. No, we wouldn't because we've got houses, but you know what I mean. So if carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and we absolutely recognize water is a greenhouse gas too, why does everyone keep falling on carbon dioxide? 
because the funny thing about carbon dioxide is that it has another effect that is quite important. Carbon dioxide fertilizes greening the earth, studies finds. Now this is an article of April 2016, you can see in the top corner, it's from NASA, links will be provided. And um, an international team of 32 authors from 24 institutions in eight countries led the effort which involved using satellite data, blah, 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 blah. The greening represents an increase in leaves on plants and trees, equivalent in area two times the continental United States. So large parts of the world are actually turning more green. Now, green leaves use energy from sunlight through photosynthesis to chemically combine carbon dioxide to draw from the air and water and nutrition tapped from the ground to produce sugars, which is the main food for the world. Once the plants go, we all go. Simple as that. Oh, and it also creates oxygen, which is, uh, yeah, a good thing. Studies have shown that increased concentrations of carbon dioxide increase photosynthesis spurring plants to grow. So plants grow better because of it. However, carbon dioxide fertilization isn't the only cause of increased plant growth. Nitrogen is also an important part. This is interesting because in the Netherlands there is a nitrogen crisis because they claim there is too much nitrogen. This is an interesting story. I'm probably going to make a video about that pretty soon. But people kind of ignore the fact that nitrogen is also an important part of the natural cycle of the world whether we like it or not but humans like to think that we're in control of everything so if something doesn't go the way we think it should go it's our fault never mind that now however the carbon dioxide fertilization isn't the only one nitrogen land cover change and climate change by way of global temperature Precipitation and sunlight changes all contribute to the greening effect. To determine the extent of carbon dioxide contribution, researchers ran the data for carbon dioxide and each of the other variables in isolation through several computer models that mimic the plant growth observed in satellite data. So to see how much of the effect is by carbon dioxide and not by any of those other things, they did some tests and results showed that carbon dioxide fertilization explains 70% of the greening. Let that sink in for a moment. 70% of the greening of the earth we have to thank carbon dioxide for. So we see that outsized role CO2 plays, we see the outsized role CO2 plays in this process. CO2 is fucking important and this is not really news either because biologists have already said that we were dangerously close to the death of plant life but okay results shows this and it's a good thing about 85 percent of earth's ice free lands is covered by vegetation this is a good thing or rather i would think it's a good thing the extent of the greening over the past 35 years has the ability to fundamentally change the cycling of water and carbon in the climate system, which again seems a good thing. Every year about half of the 10 billion tons of carbon emitted into the atmosphere from human activities remains temporarily stored in about equal parts in the ocean and plants. While our studies did not address the connection between greening and carbon storage in the plants, other studies have reported an increasing carbon sink on land since 1980s, the carbon sink obviously being the plants, which is entirely consistent with the idea of a greening earth. So carbon dioxide is helping us green the earth. Yet still we have to say that, um, I'm going to blue this out, while rising carbon dioxide concentration in the air can be beneficial for plants, it's also the chief culprit of climate change. Seriously, NASA? So, it's not actually the chief cause, but they keep blaming carbon dioxide. But, now here's another thing that carbon dioxide is doing, and I'm going to 
move this away for a second. There we go. So carbon dioxide is actually helping the world to green. Now this sounds good, but carbon dioxide is also the main cause of global warming. No, it's not because water vapor, as we said, can be at a thousand times more prevalent than carbon dioxide, but it at least as good as grabbing heat. Now it's also good at preventing heat. I mean, it stops some of the heat reaching the planet, that is true, but that's not the important part. The important part is that it's a greenhouse gas, as in it stops the heat leaving the planet, which in all fairness, I still think is a good thing. Hell, we're still in an ice age, people, so I'm not sure why we're that worried about a little bit more heat. I'm far more interested in the death of plant life, which, well, a low of, if we go too low for carbon dioxide, plant life will end. And if plant life will end, all the rest will end with it. But here's a, another important thing about the greening of the earth. And why the greening of the earth, even with carbon dioxide, is such a good thing. Rising CO2 is causing plants to release less water in the atmosphere, researchers say. Now this is important. Why? Well, because we know that there's a lot of water in the air and water works just as good as a greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide does so this would then say um, the higher the co2 the less water vapor in the air see the thing is we don't really understand the planet we live on there are lots of processes all acting at the very same time to create an equilibrium on this planet and we have hardly any influence on it at all even though we like to think we're the biggest player in the game which we're not because let's be honest sun slightly bigger than us just ever so slightly if we create the rising of co2 we are causing a greener earth and plants are really good at, at holding heat too, by the way. I mean, they stop cooling down a bit as well. But obviously it's not a greenhouse gas. Um, so yeah, the more green the world is, the more water vapor is taken out of the air and less water vapor is being brought into it. Now this is not a one-on-one -on -one thing because let's be honest, plants aren't the only way water vapor gets into the atmosphere, another way of... Uh, water vapor getting into the atmosphere obviously is from the seas and yeah people talk about well but there is more water vapor created if the temperature is hotter no not really water vapor starts forming when um, water reaches a temperature of four degrees it starts pushing out its water vapor and if the air is um, particularly dry it might suck up some of the air but the higher the temperature of the air the more water vapor it can hold so it's, it's it's all an equilibrium thing there is far more going on than we realize but to blame carbon dioxide for something without really understanding why seriously people co2 is a good thing because it helps green the earth CO2 is a good thing because it helps reduce water vapor in the atmosphere. Water vapor is a strong, as strong a greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide is. Are they the strongest greenhouse gases? No, there are greenhouse gases far stronger than um, carbon dioxide. Well, per molecule that is. Because, for example, if we say nitrous oxide, nitrous oxide is a far stronger molecule at grabbing heat apparently than co2 is nitrous oxide is about 300 times as effective as grabbing heat as co2 is the thing is however nitrous oxide is measured in parts per billion whereas carbon dioxide and water vapor are measured in parts per million and considering that a billion is a larger number 
and considering nitrous oxide is about one part per billion and um, carbon dioxide is about 400 parts per million there is far more carbon dioxide than for example nitrous oxide or methane methane is another great example i mean 84 times as effective as water vapor or carbon dioxide but also measured in parts per billion so yeah it, it, it's kind of funny because people then like to think oh methane is such a huge problem because methane is far stronger a greenhouse gas than co2 sometimes people are actually doing this i'm, I'm not sure if you already heard it but cow farts cow farts are methane methane is a problem we should have cow farts stop yeah okay it's true methane is 84 times more effective at, at grabbing heat as carbon dioxide is i know i'm just dropping these numbers i'll try to link the the, the, the information where you can find it but okay if uh, methane is 84 percent no not 84 percent 84 times more effective at grabbing heat but there's only two parts methane per billion and there are 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide and considering a million uh, sorry a billion is what a thousand mil million so that would make it two parts per billion compared to 400,000 parts per million I'm not sure if I'm doing that calculus right so don't take me up on that but yeah carbon dioxide even if measured per million would be far higher and carbon dioxide then at 400 parts per million water vapor at let's average it out at 15,000 parts per million because there are places where it's zero but there are places where it's way way higher as well and there are more places where it's high than places where it's zero so yeah carbon dioxide stops the creation of water vapor water vapor being one of the biggest greenhouse gases can people please explain to me why carbon dioxide is as big a problem as it is now the links will be provided this video has been taken a bit longer than i was planning to make it go criticism as always is more than welcome if you think you can explain to me not no that that, that that didn't sound right if you think you know something that i may have missed or if you think i'm wrong and you have a reason why i'm wrong i'm more than willing to learn and listen i might not always seem to be that but i really do want to try to understand this shit. but to me it seems like we're being driven to be afraid of something that is actually beneficial to us and no one seems to want to think about the why personally most biologists keep pushing the idea that about a thousand parts per million carbon dioxide is actually not a bad thing and don't worry people you won't die from a thousand parts carbon dioxide per million either because let's be honest the average house has about that now people are being afraid because and this is something i can also recognize people are being afraid because carbon monoxide is absolutely deadly but carbon dioxide is not well eventually it becomes a problem but that's because there's not enough oxygen it's all about those balances anyway criticism as always is more than welcome i hope to see you all soon and uh, let me hear what you think